Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Pat Flynn Show. This is your, this is your host, of course, Pat Flynn, and we're going to take some questions from Instagram. We have questions on what to do if you have maybe up to 100 pounds to lose. We have questions on pull-ups versus chin-ups. We have a question on what I think the use of machines are. We have questions on whether you can build muscle with kettlebells. We have questions on my favorite hairband. So lots of important stuff to cover uh, this fine Monday morning, which is when I'm recording this podcast. I don't know when you're listening, but thank you for listening. By the way, if you're um, tuning in over at YouTube, you'll notice we have a new background. This is, uh, this is a picture of me here with uh, just feeling nice and relaxed with the hair down. So if anybody wants, uh, if anybody wants that photo, email me at, uh, you, know, you know the address and just put, uh, put glamour shot in the subject line. We'll get that over to you. You can print that out. That won't be a problem. Okay, so these, all these questions that I'm going to answer or try to answer anyways um, on today's podcast, they come from Instagram. Now, I love Instagram because I do a lot of uh, stuff on the stories and we do weekly Q&As, but I, I don't always get to go in depth on, on the questions because Instagram, it's limited, right? You can't, there's just not that much room to have an in-depth conversation. So I do the best I can to help people out there, but every once in a while, I like to transport some of the questions over to the podcast so we can get a little bit more substantial uh, with them. So why don't we begin, and we'll cover the question on chin-ups or pull-ups first. And this comes from user Playful Warrior, and he wants to know, for a generalist, do we want to do pull-ups or chin-ups? And this is, a, this is a very common question. It's a good question. I appreciate the question. And for those who are unfamiliar, the, the basic way to differentiate these movements uh, would be this. The pull-up uh, features your palms facing away from you, uh, what we call pronated, and the chin-up is with your palms facing towards you, what we call supinated. Now, you can, of course, also perform mixed grips or neutral grips uh, with palms facing together. But those are the basic distinctions. And this is this for me is an obvious both and. I think if you want to get strong in general at pull-ups, here's kind of a, a minimum. Here's a good baseline minimum for you. Uh, practice uh, both um, and do each one one time per week and have one heavy, heavy day and one uh, sort of hypertrophy day. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, a heavy day would be something like this, five reps or fewer, um, but you're, you're pushing the intensity. So maybe you weight ease if you're already pretty strong. I would say use an intensity that's in, within your two rep max for technical failure. So that means if you're going to do three reps, use a weight or an intensity where you could do no more than five reps. And I like accumulation sets. So on your heavy day, um, just, yeah, five reps or less, pretty heavy, and just see how many good sets you can get in in, say, like 20 to 30 minutes. And I want you to treat it as a form of practice. So don't worry about, um, you know, being too specific with rest. Make sure you rest enough between sets that you feel fresh enough to really perform another good set. Uh, and then just see how many sets you can get. Again, I think in 20 to 30 minutes is a good uh, training block for that. Then on your hypertrophy day, uh, and there's always going to be a strength element uh, as well. I would recommend, you know, maybe somewhere between six to 12 reps. Uh, again, try and keep the intensity relatively high. So you know, I still think around within two reps of your technical failure. Again, for those who are unfamiliar, technical failure is when uh, you, you notice some significant decrease in rep quality, uh, whether that's your form, whether that's your rep speed. Um, so it's not absolute failure. Absolute failure is when you cannot perform the exercise anymore full stop. Technical failure is when there's some noticeable decrease in the rep quality. So if you're doing eight reps, then uh, if you're using uh, an intensity that's within two reps of your technical failure, that means you should be able to do no more than 10 until there's a significant decrease in rep quality. Like it really starts to slow down. Maybe you start trying to compensate in various ways to finish the, the movement. That, that, that to me is technical failure. And what I'd recommend here is something very simple, just three to four sets. You can just do straight sets for something like this, uh, somewhere between six to 12 reps, good controlled throughout the range of motion. So full dead hang all the way to the top. If you can add, you know, like a two to three second tempo uh, throughout the exercise, uh, even better. And then what I would do is I would alternate each week 
uh, of whether you assign uh, pull-ups or chin-ups to both of those days. So one week you'll do pull-ups on the heavy day, chin-ups on the hypertrophy day. The next week you'll do the reverse. You'll do chin-ups on the heavy day, pull-ups on the hypertrophy day. That is, I think, a, an awesome way to train both. Now, why would you want to train both? Well, I mean, the different angles, the different pulling angles are just good for you in general. You want to get strong from multiple angles, good for the shoulders, good for the back. Uh, but, you know, uh, chin-ups um, can emphasize biceps a little bit more. Pull-ups can emphasize the back a little bit more. So you do get uh, a, a different emphasis for, uh, from these exercises. And sometimes people have, um, have gaps. Well, in fact, everybody has gaps somewhere. And, um, you know, some people are kind of weak at the top. And if that's the case, maybe some heavier chin-ups will help you with that. Sometimes people are weaker at the bottom. At that case, you know, pull-ups can help you with that. So it's good to practice both because it can, they complement each other very well. Uh, so that's what I would recommend that. And then the other thing I would recommend, um, especially if you already have a, a you know, a decent base uh, with pull-ups and chin-ups is just greasing the groove. And the idea of greasing the groove is you just practice pull-ups and chin-ups kind of throughout the week in a relatively um, not very intense manner. So one way to, to do this is you have a pull-up bar in your house. Maybe it's walking into your bedroom. Whenever you go buy that thing, you just do, you do a rep, you do two reps, you do five reps. I, rarely would I recommend doing five, but you just find opportunities to practice the exercise frequently. And uh, once you, you know, once you're kind of used to or halfway decent at pull-ups and chin-ups, you tend to recover from them very quickly. I mean, I can do a lot of pull-ups and chin-ups throughout the week, and I recover from them very quickly. Now, if I do the weighted heavier sessions, I can't do that a lot throughout the week, but I can do the body weight stuff a lot throughout the week. Now, I'm also not a very heavy guy, and I have been doing pull-ups and chin-ups for a very long time, so let that be known. But that would be my general strategy. It's a both and one heavy day, one hypertrophy day, and then some greasing the groove in there. So uh, I, I, I hate to always give these like both and responses, but I, to me, that's just an absolute both and. Okay, somebody wants to know what my favorite hairband is. And they're probably, by the way, when I put my question thing up on Instagram, I had this picture. So some of these questions are definitely related to and poking fun at my hair. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you. I'm going to give you um, the best answer I can to this. There are three bands, three three hairish bands, glam rock bands that I that I absolutely love and that you may have never heard of and I want you to listen to as soon as you're done with this this episode. And you can add your own recommendations in the comments. First off, let me say something about glam rock and, and hair bands in general. Um, it was such an epic period of music. Obviously, obviously, Pat Flynn was born in the wrong decade. I mean, just just look at me. Um, I don't know why I exist here and now. I, sh I should have you know, I, I should be doing what I'm doing in the 80s. Um, I, I don't see how to get around that fact. But in terms of uh, glam rock in general, the reason I love it so much is you have just absolute pirate technicians very often uh, on the guitar, just, just screaming, howling, awesome, incredible guitar playing, uh, ridiculous vocal performances and ranges, big drums, big hair, obnoxious colors, everything about that uh, era of music before Nirvana decided to, to usher in an age of, uh, quite frankly, pretty terrible musicianship, in my opinion. Um, everything about the glam rock period I love. Now, let me give you three of my favorite bands, and then we'll get onto more serious questions. Um, and they're bands that I think were just a little too late to the scene. If they had started a couple years earlier, I think they would have been a lot bigger than they actually were. Now, they're, they're well-known bands, but they're not that well-known. Number one, my favorite, Extreme. Uh, all, everything from Extreme is amazing, but uh, especially uh, their second album, Porno Graffiti, and, three, and their third album, Three Sides to Every Story, are just absolute masterpieces. So go grab those. A lot of you probably know Extreme because they had a very famous song, More Than Words, but it's, it's all their other music that, that I love. It just is glammy funky hard rock stuff it's just it's hard to beat so extreme that's band number one number two is steel heart with mike matichevic on the vocals this guy is insane um so you want to like really good uh, incredible range uh just like peak glam rock glam metal type of band check out steel heart uh, i'll never let you go is a great song also we all die young uh is another cool tune if you ever saw the movie rock star with mark Wahlberg. Uh, the singer from Steel Heart is the guy who does a lot of vocals in that in that movie. And then number three would be Mr. Big. Mr. Big featured Paul Gilbert on the guitar, one of my favorite guitarists. 
And they've just got a ton of cool songs, Green Tinted 60s Mind, uh, Colorado Bulldog. Again, just ferocious guitar work, great musicianship, cool, hip, funky, catchy band. So those would be some of my favorite hair bands. I'm not like like Motley Crue and those guys. I'm not as, as big of a fan. Uh, I tend to like the bands that, I th again, I think we're a little too late. They're kind of coming in early 90s as that phase of music is phasing out. So I think they were overlooked. Okay, next question comes from Wes. He wants to know, what is the killer app of machine-based training if you think there is one? This is a really good question. And I told Wes I thought it was a really good question on Instagram because a lot of times, a lot of times people in the fitness industry kind of turn their noses up at machines. Oh, it's not, it's not free weights. How could you do anything but free weights? And there's all this pinky raising and people are really annoying. I think people that act like that um, either have a severe lack of imagination um, or they follow the herd uncritically and or they've just never worked with any substantial group of people in real life. Machines can serve uh, a lot of purposes. In fact, I think machines can, can be very useful. Uh, one way they're useful, I don't use them for this personally um, because I'm not a bodybuilder, but they can be useful for uh, people who are training for, you know, aesthetic, pers uh, aesthetic purposes in, in terms of like competitive uh, bodybuilding, figure competing, because um, – uh, machines, because they can be very targeted, can help a lot with, with aesthetic fine tuning. So, you know, you really want to target some area, you want to fix some, you know, uh, proportions or whatever. Machines can be very useful for that, very useful for that. And that's why a lot of professional figure competitors use machines pre precisely for that purpose. Another good thing that machines can do uh, are um, they, can, they can serve to work around injuries issues right if, if you get hurt or you're injured or you're recovering from something or in your rehab program machines can really help you to keep strength in certain areas while allowing other areas to recover so you know a lot of times if i'm working with clients uh and they've they've had some injury uh due to any number of unforeseen circumstances we can incorporate machines to keep certain muscle groups areas strong while not stressing other areas that need to uh, just you just need to ease up because they've been hurt or they've been injured. Not always so easy to do with the huge, big compound movements because everything is so uh, connected and integrated, which is good normally, right? We like that that integration, that connection. But you know, life throws um, throws some wrenches into into your plans every now and then. So the isolation or the or the more isolated types of stuff can be very can be can be very useful as long as you understand why you're doing it so if you ask me what the killer app for machine training is i would say yeah aesthetic fine tuning and as a tool uh to just work around certain injuries uh restrictions or what have you okay next question comes from tin and tin wants to know i have a 16 kilogram currently would you suggest getting a 28 kilogram or another 16 for doubles if I'm only buying one? This is a good question. Now, if you had no kettlebells at all, that would be different. But since you already have a 16, I'm pretty sure I answered this question saying get another 16. But I'm still, I'm still a little uncertain of it. So let me just give you the pros and cons. If you get another 16, um, you're going to have 32 kilograms worth of weight total. And so... That's going to be cool because you can do the double swings and the double clean. So you can still get the heavier load for all the hinging. Your stance is going to be slightly different, but it's still going to, you know, it's still going to be the fundamental hinge. You're also then going to unlock uh, double clean and press and front squat. And those are just the, those are just the big money moves as far as I'm concerned. So that's why I'm leaning towards the, the two sixteens. In fact, I have an old program called two sixteens and it's just a ton of workouts that use exactly that two 16 kilogram kettlebells. I'm gonna revamp that and do another iteration of that sometime this year. Um, I don't think you could go wrong with either, honestly. If you if you got the 28, you'd, you'd have the heavier stuff for the lower body. You could start doing some pressing and get ups with it. I mean, that's the benefit of the 28 is you'll have a, a bigger challenge uh, for get ups, single arm presses. Uh, so it's it's a trade off like anything else. You know, it's, it's all about managing compromises. But I would say if, it, for just being a well-rounded generalist, probably, probably you'll, if you're, if you're competent across the techniques, the doubles unlock so much, uh, especially the double clean and press and front squat, uh, that I would just, I would just go with that. Again, you can't go wrong either way. We've got programs either way. We've got kettlebell one and kettlebell two. So no matter where you go, we'll be able to take care of you. And of course I have tons of workouts on my YouTube channel, single and double kettlebell workouts. Uh, now, if you gave me a specific goal, I might be able to be more specific in my answer. 
but just coming from a very general perspective, that's what I'm going to say. Somebody wanted to know, what did I have for breakfast? Well, today I haven't had breakfast. I'm going to fast and I'm going to fast probably until 4 p.m. Uh, I love fasting. I was talking with a friend last night um, why, I, why I love fasting. Uh, this will tie into a question about later on about losing, losing weight. I've had a number of clients who've lost over 100 pounds, and there's some commonalities I've been thinking on. Uh, but one reason I love fasting is it just takes decisions off the table and allows me to preserve willpower. I was talking about this with Dr. Jim on, a, on an episode not long ago. You know, willpower is, I don't care how tough you are. I don't care how much you've trained. I don't care how much you've increased your tank of willpower. It's still limited. And so I take very seriously the idea of not having to do anything throughout the day that's going to drain me of willpower, that's going to give me decision fatigue. And eating decisions are one of those. So, so one thing I always tell you know people in general, clients or anybody online when it comes to nutrition is, Take decisions off the table. Don't stress about what you're going to be eating. That means have it planned in advance. Have it made in advance. Uh, this is why shakes are really useful. Just prepping your meals once a week is really useful. And fasting. Like I don't have to think about what I'm going to eat today because I'm not. Because I'm not. <laughs> I'm just not eating, um, and that feels good. I, I like that. So obviously, fasting works wonders in terms of body composition and, and health in general. But one of the hidden benefits of fasting is it just it preserves um, decision power because I want to have, I, I don't want the tank to be depleted when I need to make other decisions. Uh, the, especially when it comes to making decisions where if I am depleted, I'll probably make worse decisions, uh, decisions of, yeah, what I'm going to eat, whether I'm going to work out, how I'm going to act in, around my family, how I'm going to, you know, whether I'm going to have the, the, the energy, um, and the power to say yes to wrestling my kids in the evening. These are things that are important to me. And I don't want to waste my reserves on other decisions throughout the day that might drain me a little bit if I don't have to. Um, so what was the question? Oh, it was what did I have for breakfast? So yeah, today, nothing. But the that day, I just had olives. So sometimes one of my go-to foods, if I'm going to eat uh, throughout the day, a snack, or just I just get these, this, these little jar of olives. They're like organic olive stuff with red, pep red peppers. Awesome. Really good for you. Um, they're just tasty. I, I love them so much. Okay. So that's, that's that. All right. Well, let's tie it into the next question. So, so Herschel asks, I weigh 350 pounds and want to start eating right and working out. Where do I start? Okay. So how to, you know, I don't know exactly how much Herschel wants to, wants to lose. Remember these questions on Instagram kind of go into a little box. So there's not a lot of area to type. So I apologize if I don't answer everything as well as I could, because there's just kind of limited data coming in, but I'll, I'll try to answer it as best as I can. But it's, yeah, say, say, okay, I've got a, I've got a lot of weight to lose. Maybe it's a hundred pounds or, or up to a hundred pounds. Um, what do I do? And I, I've been out of the game. Maybe I've never even been in the game. Where do I start? Well, having worked with many people, my first client, by the way, one of my first clients, not my, not my first client, but one of my first clients lost over a hundred pounds. And her name was uh, Deanna. And this was, this was when I was training in college. And she was, she, was, she was phenomenal. And she went on to become a coach of her own. Um, and she was such an inspiration. Uh, but the model that she took was a model that I learned a lot from and working from her of, of how she became successful. And that model was something like this. And I want to I get it out there. And of course, this isn't going to be the same for everybody. But I think there's some commonalities here that I've noticed between all my clients who've made, lost major amounts of weight and kept it off. Here's things that happen. The first thing that happens is they find some type of exercise routine they really love. And for my clients, this is typically some type of kettlebell routine. Deanna loved training with kettlebells. She loved training with me. She would come to my class. She loved the exercise. Now, a lot of people try and just go nutrition. I don't think that's enough. I think nutrition is necessary for losing weight, but I don't think it's enough. I think you need the physical activity. Um, and in fact, I, I think they did a study with the, with the biggest loser, people on The Biggest Loser, and I've got a million issues with how they approach that show. But what they found is the people who, who did better afterwards were the people who kept up with a physical exercise routine. And that didn't surprise me because it's so connected and it matters. When you're exercising, yes, you're burning calories, you're building muscle, um, you're revving the metabolic engine, and all that really helps with body composition. But it also makes you feel good. It makes you feel confident. I'm sure you've all experienced this. When you have a good workout, you tend to just be more productive. You tend to want to eat better. You tend to have more energy. Movement begets movement. So you need to find some type of exercise program that you love. And frankly, starting out, I don't even care what that is. It could be kettlebells. It could be 
just your traditional weight training routine. It could be Zumba. It could be John, whatever it is, something that you love and can get into and really stick with. Uh, for me, kettlebells and, and my clients have been an awesome point of entry because, uh, again, for people who've been out of the game for a while, kettlebells are quite accessible. They're easy on the joints. They can give you strength. They can give you cardio. So just getting started with a basic kettlebell routine, I think, is a good way to begin. And they're fun. They're engaging, effective, efficient, and engaging. So that's number one. Find a kettle, an exercise routine that you can commit to, uh, I would say, you know, at least two days a week. If you can do more, that's that's great. Um, but you know that you're going to feel good about. You're going to be excited about. Number two, um, get protein up. You have to get protein up. Protein is a hinge factor in weight loss. Um, I would say at least seventy-five to one hundred grams of protein um, per day. Some you know people sometimes recommend have a gram of protein per pound of body weight a day. But if you weigh like a lot, a lot, um, I think we can we can qualify that. I think it just, if you follow the hundred gram rule, hundred grams of protein uh, per day, um, that's going to be a really good start. And we know that, you know, two major hinge factors in weight loss are calories and protein. So, so here's the things to focus on first movement. You love protein. And then where do, where do calories come in? Well, here, I think uh, I'm going to give you two, two strategies uh, that have, uh, been found very successful for many of my clients who've lost a lot of weight and kept it off. One are strategic meal replacements. That is just swapping out a couple meals here and there with quality protein shakes. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, uh, I mean, you get like a quality protein, like a whey protein powder, basic, you put in some fruits, some vegetables, maybe some healthy fats, and you're good to go. I've talked about this strategy many times on the podcast, but to quickly reiterate, why does this work? Well, one, you get, um, you get the protein in, which is awesome. That's going to help uh, increase satiety, has a high, higher thermic effect. Um, you can throw some fiber supplements in there if you want, um, some chia seeds or whatever. Uh, that's, that's sometimes helpful for people. Um, and it's also it also helps you control calories and hunger. Right, it's very calorically controlled. It's nutritionally dense. You're getting hopefully the you know a good amount of micronutrients as well because you're putting in the, the fruits and the vegetables. Um, and then maybe you do that for breakfast. Maybe you do it for breakfast and lunch. Uh, but the other reason it's good goes back to something I talked about earlier, and that is it 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 takes decisions off the table, right? Protein shakes are easy to make, and and sometimes when people get stressed and they're starting out, and you know they don't have time and they're busy, and you know sometimes even making a salad can be annoying. And that's and when things get annoying and you're already stressed and already busy, that's when uh, okay, I'm just going to go to Wendy's becomes an option or I'm just going to go grab fast food or whatever. So can, you don't underestimate how important keeping things simple and convenient are for success. Lowering barriers to entry. We've talked about this many times. It's, it's so important. So shakes are really good there because they're super easy to make. So you get the, get the little magic bullet thing. That's what I use. I think we have a ninja now, but for, for most of my existence, I had one of those magic bullets and it was magic. It's very magic. It's the most magic thing. And you put you put protein in there. You put some almond butter. You put some whatever fruits. I I love strawberries personally, but lots of the lots of different berries. Add a little banana, and then throw in all the vegetables, all the green stuff, because that all gets mixed up anyways, and it tastes very good. All right, uh, fasting can also help as well, big time. Uh, it helps because, uh, in fact, I had a, a guy. He wasn't a client of mine. But he's a, he's a cool guy. He has a really cool podcast. His name's Jimmy Aiken. He's got a podcast called Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. And he lost over 100 pounds of fasting. And he was a guy that um, he did a full episode on it. I, I recommend it uh, if you can find it. Forget the title. And I'm not going to track it down. So if you want to listen, you got to go find it. But he, you know, he did low carb for a while and he actually had success with it. And, you know, he really struggled with, with his weight for a long time, which again, something I've noticed with many clients, they, 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 it's not like they lack, um, the motivation they, they do. It's just, they lack a process. And then Jimmy, uh, decided to try intermittent fasting where he essentially did one meal a day and that worked awesome for him and is still working awesome for him from what I understand. And he lost a, a very significant amount of weight and kept it off and feels awesome just on the one meal a day plan. Um, so I think some form of intermittent fasting can be very helpful. Why? Because it takes decisions off the table, not because it's magic. Yes, there seems to be some benefits to fasting irrespective of weight loss. There was a study published in Cell Metabolism that showed that there were uh, health benefits of fasting that were independent just from, from the weight loss, which is cool. But it does help to control calories. Um, 
and it's very convenient, right? And, and so I would I would consider some fasting option as well. Uh, for my clients, I usually you know we we play around with the with the with the approach. Some clients really do just thrive on the one meal a day approach that you know hey or a, a, a limited eating window, like they just eat between 4 and 7 p.m. or something like that. Uh, other strategies include a 5-2 fast, which is like, hey, twice a week, we're going to just have uh, you know, a light lunch. Maybe that's just a shake and then a normal healthy dinner. And then you know, we kind of eat, quote unquote, normal healthy throughout the rest of the week. But those two days a week are a little bit more intense in terms of fasting. Uh, so I would say listen to some of my other podcasts because I explore different fasting methods. Of course, I'm a big advocate of the fast 15, just a daily 15 hour fast, which is not very uh, crazy, right? It's, it's really for a lot of people just pushing back um, breakfast a little bit. I have podcasts on that. Um, and the final thing I will say, um, final two things I'll say for long term successful uh, and significant weight loss um, would be this two things. One, vary the intensity. Don't try and, and go super hard all the time uh, with your exercise. You know, have some days that are more intense than others. We talk about the importance of, of waving the load. I know once you get started and you're seeing results, it's very exciting. And you just want to do more and more and more. Don't do that because you very much risk burning out and you'll be disappointed once you hit a plateau. Start intelligently, wave the load, have a good structured program. And then the last thing is just walk a lot. Walk, hike ruck, try and do some form of low level um, aerobic activity every day. I think brisk walking is is probably the best one that uh, that you can do. Okay. All right. So that's that's my best general advice for if you have a significant amount of weight to lose, and you want to do so reasonably sustainably. Those are some of the principles I would really focus on exercise program you love if you can get the resistance training in there, try to do it because it does make a difference. Um, Protein calories, fasting in some capacity, um, lots, lots of walking and um, uh, fluctuating the intensity of your training program. Don't just try and keep going crazier and crazier. It does not sustain. All right, sweet. Let's take one more because I need to go write. Um, I'm working on this new book, by the way, my, my dear gentle listeners. So um, I'm going to go do that soon. But until then, let's take this last question, which comes from Caleb. Caleb wants to know, can you build muscle with kettlebells quite easily? Um, One of the most common questions that I've get, I've I've done podcasts on this uh, many times before, but I don't mind answering same questions because I know there's new people always coming into the podcast, which I super appreciate. So if you have questions for the podcast, ask them. Don't ever feel like, oh, I bet this Pat's been asked this a million times because I probably have been, but I don't care. Um, I, you know, I always like reflecting back on this and seeing if I can give better answers. Um, and I understand that just because I have said it before, it doesn't mean that everybody has heard it before. So I do not mind repeat questions. I do not mind basic questions. In fact, I really appreciate them and I encourage them. So please send them in. Um, I, I mean that. I try to treat every question as seriously and as respectfully as I can on this podcast. Um, so yeah, you can. Um, I mean, building muscle is is a matter of getting the intensity right and the volume right and the density right. So it's more about the variables than it is the instrument. Um, the kettlebell can be very helpful, um, but when it comes to kettlebells and building muscle, probably, probably. Uh, you want to start looking towards the double kettlebells. And there's two exercises in particular that I have always found very useful for me for getting my skinny Irish body uh, a little bit more muscular and my clients as well. And those would be the double clean and press and the front squat. And uh, you need to, it's not just intensity. So it's not just weight, but the volume, the volume is very important as well. So we want to make sure that we're pushing the volume, um, you know, enough that we can really spur uh, the muscle growth. Um, so here's what I would say. Check out. I have uh, I have a program called a uh, program that became quite popular, and I've had a couple different iterations throughout the year called the Prometheus Protocol. If you just Google Prometheus Protocol, it'll it'll pop up. Um, try and find the more recent iteration. I have a blog or article on it somewhere. There's there's one from a number of years ago. Still good, holds up well. But I, I've I've done newer iterations that I think are a little bit more finely tuned. The details off the top of my head escape me, but I want to point you in that direction. But anyway, it features double clean and press and front squat. I believe also optionally you can put um, chin-ups and deadlifts in there, but that you don't necessarily need them. And it's going to um, feature, again, kind of a heavier lower rep day, 
and a um, more moderate, higher rep hypertrophy day. Uh, but if you want to build muscle with kettlebells, uh, double clean and press, which is an awesome full body movement. It's a big stroke of an exercise. We have the hinge. We have the upper body grinding push. It's full body. It's systemically draining. Uh, and you can really load that up, right? Like most people are probably not going to move beyond pressing two beasts for 10 reps. I know I certainly never have and never will. Um, and same thing with the front squats. We can, we can really challenge ourselves because the nature of the kettlebell front squat is very different than a barbell front squat. You got to kind of wrestle that kettle, those kettlebells out in front of you. It requires that anaconda strength. Really good for smashing the quads. And between those two exercises, you can get, you can get a good stimulus, a good muscle-building stimulus. And then I would make those the core of your program. Just make sure you get uh, enough volume in of those exercises. Uh, and the Prometheus protocol has a pretty savage amount of volume. Right? We're just trying to force the body to grow. Uh, and we do 10 sets of five sometimes and just, just, just boom, 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 boom. Double clean and press. I mean, you will feel, you'll feel meaty after that. I promise you. Uh, doesn't mean you'll have grown immediately, but you'll feel like, okay, your body's gonna be like, we need to, we need to, we need to, we need to make some adjustments here if we're gonna handle this type of volume. Um, and uh, I forget, it was, maybe it's a six week initial, six weeks, and then deload, and then you have one more uh, for the eight week. I design a lot of programs. I'm sorry, I just don't have the details fresh on my mind. But just Google it. You can stop listening to me now. Just Google Prometheus Protocol if you want to check that out. Anyway, friends, a few announcements before we go. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching the Pat Flynn Show. If you're on YouTube, please like, comment, subscribe, share. If you're on iTunes or Google Play or wherever on the podcast world, again, the reviews really help the show. I would super duper. Uh, super do do pretty boo blah, blah. just I would it, it means a lot thank you I would really appreciate it I uh, got some really cool interviews coming up this week uh, I'm going to start if, if you are on YouTube I will try and get more of the solo episodes up so I don't put all the podcasts on YouTube I put some of the interviews up there that where we have the faces and stuff but I just realized I can actually record a podcast over a PowerPoint and I can put up a, a, a selfie <laughs> be with my hair down and you can just look at that uh, so there you go. That's um, that's now something I will try to do more often of. Uh, but wherever you're listening, thank you. We've got some cool programs coming up this month. We've got a new strong on challenge coming soon, which I'll be announcing. We have our here's the big one, our virtual killing it with kettlebell certification starting in March, starting in March. My friends, I want you to check that out. All right. Um, you're going to want to be a part of that. Dan John's going to be giving us some material for that. We've moved the certification online. Um, I've, I did a full podcast on this. I don't want to repeat it now. If you just go back like a week or two, you'll see me announce the certification. Check that out. I want you to join us. It's going to, if you're serious about kettlebells, if you're serious about coaching, you're going to get a lot out of this. And there's not going to be a better time to do this than this year because of the whole COVID situation, making it virtual. It will not be more convenient uh, and awesome. So thanks for listening. Uh, really appreciate it. I appreciate you. And we will talk to you uh, very soon.